ground and roughly the time period that it occurred. And so let's say that the debris was being picked up along the shore in the southeast area of Akito Island in Japan. And so what we're looking for is actually where that path intersects with the flight path. Where we see these particles now intersect with the green line, which is K007's flight path, we would say that's probably the origin or the location of where the wreck site could be found. After tracking the currents back to the crash site, Howlett and Spaulding confirm their results by following the debris forward again. Now that we have information about the actual wreck site, we've essentially overlaid the, where the wreck was found by the green airplane symbol that says wreck found, and we've overlaid on that as well the location of where we thought the search area should have been located for the debris field that we saw. See that the, the location of the wreck is to the south and west slightly of where the missile attack occurred, which seems consistent with the flight path and, and uh, subsequent airplane motion after the attack occurred. The wreckage was found by the divers here, which is approximately 38 kilometers, or that's about 20 nautical miles from Sakhalin Island. And then that indicates that the wreckage was located just outside the 12-mile limit of territorial waters of Soviet Union. That's right, Ron. It looks like it was about 14 nautical miles offshore. This confirms where the Korean plane hit the water, but it doesn't betray where the Soviet fighter attacked its target. Did the deadly missile strike the jumbo jet over neutral or Soviet territory? Russian aviation investigators Vladimir Kofman and Yuri Chigorov were part of the original International Civil Aviation Organization team in 1983. Presented here are the results of the decoding of the black box recording from plane KAL-007. The decoding was conducted in 1983. Because we did not have proper equipment, the decoding was done manually. Based on data from Soviet radar, KAL-007 did not plunge straight down after being struck by the missile. Instead, it went into a long, wide spiral. Here, on this graph, we see the plane's movements after it was hit. Here is the downward spiral with loss of altitude and speed. With the spiral descent, the plane's fuselage skin started disintegrating. The debris was dispersed over the five to seven kilometer radius. In fact, very little debris was ever found. The Soviets cited this fact as evidence that KL-007 was a spy plane. To this day, General Kornikov is skeptical that the 747 was a civilian aircraft. I'm still convinced there were no passengers on that plane, and I have grounds to think so. No intact bodies were recovered from the crash site. This fueled countercharges that the Soviets had captured the passengers and were holding them prisoner. Where were the remains? Submarine Captain Mikhail Gears piloted one of the submersibles involved in the recovery. We were actually looking for the Boeing or what was left of it. And our main task was to recover the black boxes. Once the Soviets found the black boxes, they wanted to determine if there had been passengers aboard the alleged spy plane. Only fragments of four human bodies including a child, were ever recovered. We found bones and body parts. You've seen my pictures. There were many underwater creatures that immediately eat everything, including crabs, and there was a strong current there. For a month, at a depth of over 200 meters, they were trying to fetch human remains from underneath a heap of plane debris. The remains were taken to the seashore, and doctors tried putting body parts together to determine how many people there were. Identifying the remains was impossible. In fact, authorities were unable to prove conclusively that the body parts had even come from passengers of KAL-007. 
There were very few remains from the crash of Korean Airlines 007. And we now know that the Soviet ships had actually found the wreckage, and they did not either salvage the cargo or find ways to give back to the families anything of the possessions or the bodies of the, the passengers. There is speculation that uh, any of remains that were either recovered from the wreckage or that washed on shore were destroyed by the Soviets because they did not want evidence of what they had discovered. So what had happened to the bodies? How could they have vanished? Some experts believe that the aeroplane and its passengers were obliterated upon impact. If the wreckage is seriously uh, torn apart and, and just in small pieces, we'd have to assume that it had a lot of airspeed and uh, a lot of impact when it hit the water. Conversely, if the uh, fuselage and other parts of the airplane are largely intact, then you'd have to assume uh, a lesser impact, but still enough to uh, kill everybody on the airplane. KL-007 certainly could have disintegrated upon crashing into the ocean, the same way many planes do when they crash into the ground. Still, many relatives of the victims felt that the lack of remains indicated that there must have been survivors. There are still some family members who would like to believe that their loved one is alive, even if they're being held hostage in a prison in Siberia. The fact that there were very few personal effects that were found means that there is no closure for the family members. They had no memorabilia of their loved one that they could bury and have a place to go grieve over. In 1993, Russian journalist Andrei Ilyesh organized a second dive to the crash site to search for clues. He invited Mikhail Gears to help with the investigation. The main question still engendering meets is why no corpses were found. The task was to raise numbered parts of the plane and dissipate the ridiculous theories that this was the wrong plane and the Russians were hiding something. I retrieved the numbered parts so that we could send them to Boeing in Seattle and prove that they belong to that specific plane. Ilyash personally retrieved several items from the seabed. He says, these proved there were no survivors, that KL-007 disintegrated. This is inflatable life jacket. You can see that it belonged to Korean Airlines. The passenger apparently didn't have time to put it on. It all happened very fast. We brought this up from the bottom during our expedition. It was held down by big metal parts, otherwise it would have floated up and been carried away by the current. Do swift currents, scavengers, and time account for the surprising scarcity of crash debris and human remains? And there's still the question of whether Soviet missiles connected with the Korean passenger plane. Had KL-007 already passed into neutral and supposedly safe airspace? Or was it over Sakhalin Island and its top secret military bases? And if the former, why did the USSR withhold the black boxes from international investigators for nearly 10 years? For almost 10 years, the shooting down of Korean Air Flight 007 was shrouded in mystery. Finally, in 1992, the Russian Federation relinquished the plane's black boxes to Korean authorities. A second official investigation released in May of 1993, concluded that the Soviet Defense Forces had exercised proper conduct and made every attempt to identify and warn the passenger plane before firing on it. The report also concluded that the fighter pilot had attacked the 747 in Soviet airspace. Jim Oberg, an expert on Soviet disasters, disagrees. Oberg noticed but on page 10 of the 1993 report, the exact coordinates of where the plane was struck by the missiles were listed, as was the time and how far off course the 747 had flown. According to the ICAO report, the target was hit at 6.25 p.m. At the time, KL-007 
was 350 nautical miles to the right of Airway R20. The coordinates of the location are 46 degrees north and 141 degrees east. The most precise data was from the Russian tracking data itself, and in a supplement to the report in 93, the Russian government and the military provided tracking data which unambiguously showed the aircraft out past the 12-mile limit. Are you telling me that Korean Airlines Flight 007 was shot down outside of Soviet airspace? By a few miles, not by much, but clearly past it in international waters when the missile was launched. It had already crossed the 12-mile limit back into international waters where it was destroyed. These incriminating coordinates come from the Russians themselves. The reconstruction of the trajectory using the black box data and computer modeling still gave a little uncertainty of a, of a few miles. But it's the Russian data from their own radar sites and numeric values of the position that they gave in 1992 that, when plotted on a map, show where it was attacked. Even so, was there any reasonable justification for the attack? The Soviet interceptors did not follow the international standards for intercepting aircraft that might be hostile over a country's own airspace. Those standards require that if there is a concern about an airplane being over your country's airspace and not being identified, that the interceptors are to go up and flash lights, uh, waggle their wings, try to make uh, radio contact, to try to do something to get the attention of the intercepted airplane. Nobody can suggest, believably, that the Russians, the Soviets, were justified in doing what they did to KL-007 in 1983. Because, among other things, it presented no clear threat to them. It had already transited all their airspace it was going to transit. In fact, when they attacked it, it had already exited their airspace and was back out in international airspace, proceeding on toward Japan. I don't believe the, the attack was justified because the fighter really didn't try to follow the standard procedures to identify this aircraft and warn it. Uh, if it had gone up close enough to get next to it and alert the pilots, he certainly should have been able to identify it as a, a civil aircraft. The attack was absolutely not justified because the procedures required by international law for an unidentified aircraft involve identification procedures. 